Good morning, everyone. I'm really excited for uh, this morning. I'm going to say Merry Christmas still. Um, I am still in the Christmas spirit. I'm not giving in to the fact uh, the rest of the world can, can move on, but I'm going to celebrate a little bit longer. I'll probably have my tree to the end of January anyways. So, yeah, come on. I appreciate the, the, the support. Um, I'm really excited for this morning. I um, want to thank Justin for uh, just the opportunity to preach. I don't normally preach with this Bible, so I don't really know where my iPad's going to go, but we'll figure it out. Um, but yeah, so we just finished the Advent season. It's kind of wrapping up, obviously. I'm not wrapping it up, but the rest of us have wrapped it up. We just finished our Advent series as well. And so Today is a great opportunity to look back, um, it, to use an analogy to take inventory of this past year and also to look forward ahead at what's to come. And the question or the questions to, to deal with um, are somewhat, how did I do and what, what's next? So it's a, a looking back as well as a looking forward. And today we're going to be reading out of John 4, 1 through 42 in order to kind of get a grasp of uh, kind of how we should look back over this past year, but also what we should be expecting moving forward. Uh, and I feel like this is really something um, that God has for us this morning. So excited to, to dive in. Um, if you're reading in uh, on via some form of technology, we're going to be reading out of the ESV. And so you can follow along on an app or in your Bible um, as you flip there. But once again, it's John 4 verses 1 through 42. It says, now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. A father is worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know that Messiah is coming, He who is called Christ. When He comes, He will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am He. Just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, What do you seek, or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, to, to one another Has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. 
Already the one who weeps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together, for here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I say you'd reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their, in, into their labor. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many, were, and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. This is the word of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. We thank you that as we read this passage that we see your heart both for us as well as for the lost. We see uh, an incredible transformation and restoration. And Father, we pray that we would either receive that or understand just the power of that in our own lives, the truth of it. We pray that as we continue to study your word, that you would give us ears to hear what it is you have to say and that you would pierce us to the very core of our being with your truth, that it would settle in our hearts. We pray that you would bless this time together in Jesus' name. Amen. I love this passage, and this is one of those passages, as I was preparing it, what I intended to speak on uh, is still a a bit of the focus of the passage, but not the the larger one. And so God kind of rearranged everything as I was reading through this passage, and I'm so really excited for what it is, because I think God has a word for us this morning, but as we begin this passage, almost immediately this chapter starts with scandal. And understanding why it's so upsetting that Jesus would talk to this woman is really important to understanding the overarching message of this passage. That Jesus uses the restored to draw the broken to restoration. Now, who does Jesus have a conversation with? Well, the first identifier of her is that she's a Samaritan. And there, there's a map that we have to kind of explain, um, maybe it'll pop up, ah, there, now you can say ooh or ah, um, but this is a map of uh, where, oh, that's not actually too, uh, yeah, that's not actually how it's supposed to look. Um, so you can probably take that away. Uh, well, leave it up. Um, I'll, 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 yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> So basically, down here is Jerusalem, and that's where Jesus is actually coming from. Um, It's actually, I think, right about here is where Jerusalem is supposed to be. And so he goes straight up, uh, following that red line in Sakaar, you can actually see it's the first little uh, bubble out to the side. Jesus addresses a Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. That's where Jesus, this whole story is taking place. So Jesus heads north, but what the more ardent Jews at the time did, uh, particularly the Pharisees, is so great was the distaste for Samaria, the view, the, the, the Jewish view of Samaria at that time, kind of these half-breeds. There was a lot of tension between the two. And as a result of that, in order to not become unclean, um, as the Pharisees saw it, the, the Jordan River runs along the, the border of um, Judea, Samaria, and um, up into Galilee. And so what a lot of the uh, Pharisees and the more ardent Jews would actually do in order to get to Galilee is they would bypass Samaria completely. And so instead of just taking the easy way north, they hated the Samaritans so much that they would actually cross over the Jordan River, go up along that green line right there all the way until they got to Galilee, and then they would cross back over the Jordan River to go into the land of Galilee. And so that's a little bit of an understanding just how much uh, Samaritans were viewed as kind of an other class. Um, There was a lot of ethnic tension during this time between those two states. And so that's the first thing that is coming. And the disciples have a lot of this kind of um, racism, really, for uh, the Samaritans as well. And so they're going with Jesus because Jesus is leading them there, but they're not really comfortable in this place and probably weren't really happy to have to go into the city to, to buy provisions and such as well. So the first thing that we know about this woman is that she's a Samaritan. The other thing is that she's a Samaritan woman. 
And the Samaritan women were actually viewed as even worse than the Samaritan men. Um, there was this idea that they were perpetually unclean, so unclean in a ritualistic sense. Um, but it, th- there was a lot of kind of baggage just packed up in that as a Jewish person. And so she was a Jew, she was, or, or she was a Samaritan, she was a Samaritan woman. And as the cherry on top of all of that, even the people that she grew up around um, had ostracized her due to her sin. Um, she was an outcast among her own people. And so because they all knew what this woman had been engaged in. They all knew that she had uh, kind of had multiple husbands and was living with a man now that wasn't her ho- husband. And so she was isolated from the very society that uh, she had grown up in. And one of the reasons we know she was so isolated is because typically women would come to this well at the the either the early morning or the evening, typically what was the cooler parts of the day. And so this is likely in December, but still that kind of pattern would have followed. And yet it says that in the sixth hour is when this woman came. And this is using the Jewish calendar. And so the sixth hour that's being referred to by John here is actually noon. So she was coming in what would have been known to be the hottest part of the day. And the reason for that was to avoid anyone in the village. She was trying to get to the water as like a, a, a just in the off time um, when it was the least likely that anyone would be there. And obviously Jesus um, is there when she comes in, but she's trying to avoid people to the best of her ability. Now, this, so this conversation with, that Jesus had with this woman offended all parties' sensibilities. It offended the disciples because this was a, 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 a Samaritan woman and the people of Samaria would have been, had their sensibilities offended as well because this woman was the worst of sinners in their eyes. But Jesus isn't concerned about that, and we see him restoring this woman as they talk. There's this transformation that kind of happens in her life, and he's obviously sharing this idea about living water using this incredible analogy in the midst of this conversation. He actually reveals himself as the Messiah, which he doesn't really normally do, but because the woman is a Samaritan and not a Jew, she doesn't have this, uh, this context in mind in regards to the Messiah. But there's this masterful analogy in the context of the conversation. She's talking about regular water. He brings up this living water, and it's really a master class in uh, the, the use of analogies when we're, we're approaching people about um, the gospel and about Jesus. So Jesus shares with her, he, he has this conversation, and she believes him as the Messiah. And there's an interesting transformation um, that happens in her, or there, the interesting thing that happens is there's this transformation, because now she has been restored, and she goes back to town and tells everyone about Jesus. They say, okay, cool, she's really excited, so she just goes and tells people, but remember, she's, the, this is the woman who was avoiding everyone at all costs. It's possible that she had actually run out of water the night before, had used it all up, yet was biding her times in uh, that morning, just holding off until everybody else had, had kind of spread out, maybe heard some people coming back into the town, talking to other people, and then left in order to go to the well once it was once there was an all clear so she wouldn't have to come in to contact with everyone. But the, the very woman who was actively avoiding people was actively avoiding everyone in this city in order to avoid the shame of her life, the scornful looks, the whispers behind her back as she walked around. She ran back to the village and rounded up everyone she could. So this woman who was actually avoiding everyone now goes and starts having intentional face-to-face conversations with people going door-to-door, running up to them and telling them about Jesus There's this incredible restoration that happens in her life where she was before she met Jesus is completely different from who she is after. And as we look back on this year, there's a couple of ways that we can feel. Maybe as you look back on the year, you're feeling really amped up. uh, Things went well. You overcame sin. You overcame some addictions, perhaps. Your relationship with God is feeling great. You're just in a really, really good spot. And so you look back over this past year, and it's like, yeah, I'm ready for 2022 because that's going to be even better. And obviously, this this last year was better than 2020 for a lot of people. Um, And so maybe you're feeling really good, but 
I imagine that there's a number of you who feel a little bit more like I do typically at the end of the year. You feel like this woman before she encounters Jesus. You feel ashamed. You feel broken. You feel weighed down by the, maybe the failure. So as you look back over this past year, you're not counting the victories in your life, but you see maybe a few victories, but really it's this overwhelming sense of areas where you may have failed or areas where you may have struggled. And that's typically where I come. I, I come into the end of the year and I'm looking back with a little bit of dread because I know I'm going to be pretty critical of myself. I'm not seeing a lot of victories, and so there's this sense of depression almost and um, just a, a, a negative feeling when I come to this part of the year. And here's the thing, though. Jesus didn't come to the woman after her life was restored. He was the one who restored her life. Jesus didn't come after her life was all put together. Instead, Jesus came into her life, and he was the one who put everything as it should be. Remember real quick that Jesus encounters this woman in uh, the middle of the day, and so she, it's kind of just this ridiculous time in Instead of, she's living in the state of shame and isolation, and Jesus comes into all that pain with gentleness and compassion, speaking to her, actually interacting with her as a Jewish man coming and talking to this Samaritan woman who had been isolated, the only probably love she had actually truly received in a long time, and tells her about, he says, I have living water. I have what you truly need that will never leave you empty. Or leave you empty. I have abundant life. I have grace. I have love for you. And so speaking into all this woman's pain and brokenness, words of truth, words of affirmation, speaking that he has all of these things for her. And however you may feel as you look back on this past year, wherever place you may be this morning, if you've accepted Christ, you're the after of this woman, not the before. You're not the woman who came to the well. You're the woman who left the well having had a conversation with Jesus. And the same thing that Jesus is offering to her, the living water, is things that God has for all of us, the love, the joy, the peace, all these things. He says uh, his grace is sufficient for you. We have, there's a relationship with God that is available for you that he desires to have with you. The God from whom all good things come, that is what is available for us this morning. And so Jesus restores us. But then after that restoration, he uses us. Those now, he uses those now restored to draw the broken to restoration. Jesus has this conversation with her, and the disciples come back really confused. Uh, they, they went into the city, weren't really having it. They come back, and now Jesus is talking to a Samaritan woman. They don't necessarily know the history of this woman, but they would have been pretty shocked to find their teacher, their rabbi, the one who was actually leading them, talking to this woman, and kind of offending all sense of culture and um, just what, uh, what was right at the time, at least in their society. And as they approach, she heads back into town, and then Jesus takes this opportunity to teach his disciples. And this is really the passage, the part of the passage that I love. This is really exciting. And so while he teaches them, he says this, do, not, do you not say, there are yet four months and comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying hold true, holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Now this, word, or this phrase that Jesus uses, white for harvest, um, there was the, the area where Jacob's well were, where the disciples were meeting back with Jesus, uh, was surrounded by these vast grain fields. Um, Sikar had a number of grain fields around it, and so they would have looked out over these fields, and they wouldn't have been ready at the time. But when the harvest was ready, all the fields, as the, the grain started to 
come of age, the fields would have turned white. And so instead of looking out over these, this greenery, um, now it would have looked like the fields were actually white. And so that's what Jesus is saying there when he says white with harvest. But Jesus says you're, you're all familiar with farming. And like you disciples or, or those of you following me, like you understand how farming works. You've grown up in an agrarian society, and so you, you have an idea. And so you would say uh, harvest is December now, so harvest comes. He wouldn't say December, but he would say harvest comes in about four months, right? And they would all nod in agreement. And as they're nodding, he would turn their focus from the fields to the village And he says, he would say, look, the harvest isn't four months, it's now. And as they looked back at the village, they would see hundreds of people that this woman had gathered from the village coming and to hear from Jesus. That was the harvest that Jesus was talking about in this passage. And so he's saying that it's not the grain fields that matter. Like, yes, there's a a harvest that's coming in that sense, but this is the harvest that matters. And hundreds of Samaritans were coming. What a sight that would have been to have been there and to look and to see hundreds of people coming to hear Jesus, to hear about this Messiah that this woman um, met. And this wasn't a group of people that the Israelites would have expected either. Remember, they're, they're Israelites, they're Jews, and so they, they would have expected, yeah, like the, the Jews would obviously like believe in the Messiah, but Samaria, like these, like the, these kind of people who are going a, a religiously different way, they would never would have expected these people to come to Jesus. And I think that's a word for us this morning, is no one expects a harvest here in Rhode Island either. In New England, in Rhode Island, in the Northeast, in Providence, no one expects us to have a harvest, but I think what God has for us this morning, what he wants us to know is that the time, that the field is white with harvest. The harvest is now, and so as we go into this next year, not to go with the sense that Oh, if I share the gospel with somebody, or oh, if I invite my friend to church, that there's, it's not going to work out. But Jesus is speaking to us even this morning that go in power, go believing in the power of the gospel because the fields in Providence, the fields in your neighborhood, the fields are white with harvest. So maybe the, the feeling that you have is Still, that, that sense of brokenness. Um, the, the question I think that we can come to, or the question that we have this morning is, how does that happen? How does Jesus draw people to restoration? How does he use the restored to draw the broken to restoration? It was the Samaritan woman that got the villagers to come. She was the one that Jesus actually used. And so as she was restored, she went back, having felt the love of Jesus impact her life. She went back to the city, to the place where she once avoided people in order to talk to every person and tell them to go see this Jesus who had changed her life. The woman was restored, but these people still needed Jesus. They were struggling with depression, struggling with brokenness, with uh, just loneliness and addictions. They were still trying to feed the pain of their own, or the, the, the emptiness of their own lives with sin. And they were still trying to find hope in idols and still wanting to feel loved because they were broken. And who does Jesus use to draw them near? He uses the Samaritan woman that everyone in that city knew the history of. And so maybe you come this morning and even as you're, you hear about, well, like the, the possibility of going and sharing the gospel and seeing the fields white with harvest and you, you kind of feel this weight of, well, this is something that I'm supposed to do. Maybe that doesn't feel great because you're thinking that as I go, like these are people that know my history. They know what, what I've been in. They know that like I'm not feeling necessarily in a, a, a great place myself. My life is a wreck. I can't share the gospel with anyone. Maybe those are the lies that you're hearing this morning. But God uses the Samaritan woman, the woman who everyone knew exactly what she had been up to. He uses her to draw her entire village to Jesus. As she goes, as she goes, having felt, having been transformed by Jesus, she goes and shares. And we 
are the restored this morning. As Christians, we are those who have experienced Jesus, have experienced restoration. And as we go, Jesus is going to use us to draw the broken around us to restoration. Just as he used the Samaritan woman, he'll use you too. He'll use us as well. And so if you're a believer this morning, the, what do you do with what we've heard? How do we respond to this? And I think the first thing is, what do you not do? Um, this isn't a license to sin. Um, just to, to clarify, the, the Samaritan woman wasn't free to just, she wasn't restored and now was able to go back to living exactly how she was. No, Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my commands. The, the decision to follow Christ means turning from sin in order to follow him. But Another way that we can respond is, having been restored by Jesus, let what he did in your life overflow into telling others about him. Just as the woman was restored and she went back having been changed by Jesus, all people are just like us. They're all uh, before we experience Christ. They have kids that they care about getting good grades. They have gardens that they're tending to, they're taking out the trash, they're uh, trying to get good grades in classes, they're trying to put their life together, and yet they're doing that in the midst of brokenness, in the midst of pain. And so, whereas we've experienced Jesus and get to go about those things the, the, with a hope and a joy in knowing that the love of Christ fills us, we get to bring that to other people. The call is for us to tell these other people about Jesus, to tell those who haven't experienced that restoration yet. And as you think and reflect on this past year, speak the word of God over yourself alongside the reflection. So as you're looking back, as you're taking inventory, don't s- simply sit in the lie that, you have ju- that, that your life is just a wreck, but instead combat those lies with the word of God, that his grace is sur- Uh, sufficient for you in your weakness that or his grace is sufficient for you for his power is made perfect in weakness that nothing can separate you from the love of Christ claim that over yourself so even as you're looking back as maybe these negative thoughts are coming to bear speak the word of life over yourself claim these verses for yourself and if you're not a, a believer this morning, there is a God who can restore you. This passage isn't just for uh, a historical one, but maybe you've come this morning and you've tried everything else possible and nothing has worked. Maybe you're coming just checking Christianity out and just trying to see what it's all about, and, but you know that there's something more in life that you haven't grasped. This opportunity, uh, th- there's an opportunity to experience a relationship with Jesus this morning, even as we just had Christmas yesterday, the, uh, there was this rejoicing. Obviously, a number of people were rejoicing and just kind of getting around family. But there's a greater truth in that, in that Jesus came as a human in order to live a life that we were supposed to live and die a death that we deserve to die. He came and lived among man, God becoming flesh in order to live among us and to die on the cross and then raise again so that we could have a relationship with God. That's an opportunity that we all have to experience, that we all have available to us this morning to experience the restoration, the God from whom all good things come. And so everything changes as we follow him in the best possible way. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for the restoration that you have offered us. And even as we've been restored, we pray that this upcoming year, that we would go in the joy of that and the power of that, that we would go and would share the gospel with others, that we would go with a belief that the fields are white with harvest and that you would use us, a restored people, to draw the broken to restoration. In Jesus' name. Amen.